Uh, I'm Daan and I'm uh, honored to host today uh, Connell Elliott, uh, former uh, MSR colleague and a good friend of mine. Uh, and Connell used to work here at Microsoft Research uh, until 2002. And, uh, and now he's a distinguished scientist at uh, Target. Um, but when he was here at Microsoft Research, uh, I was still a PhD student and I remember being so inspired by his beautiful work on, on functional reactive animations. And at that time, it was, was really inspirational to me. And uh, uh, one thing that Connell is great at is taking something really complicated in that time, like animations. It was always in matrices and, and frames and timers. And he kind of rephrased it in a beautiful way about the essence of animations as, as functions of time. And I think uh, with this work, he kind of applies the same trick again, but now in terms of uh, differentiation and machine learning, it's always about all these complicated things. And, you almost don't see the essence, and this talk will hopefully shed some light on it. So thanks a lot, Connell. Right. Right. Thanks, Dan. <clears throat> it's great to be here. Uh, yeah, I was at uh, Microsoft Research in the graphics group from uh, 94 to 2002. Uh, had a good time. So uh, this is my first time back giving a talk. So anyway, uh, we're going to talk about automatic differentiation, uh, and uh, which has to do roughly with computing derivatives uh, automatically. Um, so a good place to start would be a question, what's a derivative? Right? This is like the heart of the matter. If we don't know what this means, it's kind of hopeless uh, to have any sort of a clean, rigorous, uh, illuminating story about automatic differentiation. So if you had an education like me, you probably, uh, let's say I, I took calculus one in high school, and I learned the derivative of a function at a point as a number. Okay, and that number has to do with the ratio of how fast the output of the function is growing relative to the input at that point. <clears throat> so that's kind of calculus one perspective. But a little later, it turns out, well, it might not be a number. It might be a vector. So if my function uh, yields a uh, uh, higher dimensional result, not a scalar, not, not just like reals, uh, we can get a vector out. But the function could instead uh, consume uh, a higher dimensional result, in which case we get a different kind of vector. Um, the, these two are, not, are often not distinguished, which leads to all kinds of uh, confusions and bugs in software, uh, but they're really importantly different. They look alike, but they mean radically different things, the vector covector. And then a little later, say, well, if we have higher dimensional domain and codomain, input and output of function, in which case we're going to have, okay, we're going to have a matrix uh, of partial derivatives, which is uh, sometimes called the Jacobian matrix. All right, so maybe we've like arrived at the fully general story here, uh, higher dimensional uh, domain and codomain, but well, there are higher derivatives. A higher derivative is a derivative of derivatives. So it's a derivative of two. So a higher derivative is going to be even higher dimensional than, than two, for instance. So you get these kind of arbitrarily high dimensional tensors, we call them. So anyway, and then so we have all these different notions of derivatives. And every one of those notions has its own chain rule. They're all different from each other. And of course, when you see you know, this many variations, there are probably going to be other variations as well. So we get a complicated, incomplete story. Uh, and, and this isn't going to go well for calculus students. It's not going to go well for computer scientists or software engineers. So we need a better story. So let's start over. Instead of saying that the, um, the derivative of a function is a number, a vector, covector, matrix, or some kind of higher dimensional beast, there's one general, beautiful, unifying story, which is the derivative is a linear transformation. Okay? That's a general story. So I'm going to talk about uh, D. D is the differentiator. Okay, so differentiation is a function. I'm going to um, uh, show you some notation. If, if it's unfamiliar, you're confused, please interrupt me and ask questions or about anything else. Uh, I, I enjoy interaction during the talk, and then there'll be time for questions at the end as well. So uh, this is a bit Haskell-y notation. So this means that D has this as the following type. So differentiation consumes a function from A to B, and it yields a function from A to linear transformations from A to B. Okay, that's the general notion of a derivative. All of these other notions were representations of linear maps. And all of the chain rules are implementations of the same thing, which is, uh, which I'm going to show on the next slide. OK, so here's the general definition of a derivative, which is we're going to take a function f at a, OK? And we're going to perturb the input a little bit and sample f. But we're also just going to take the result and perturb it a little bit linearly. That's the d of f. It's going to be a linear transformation. d f a is. So we feed epsilon in to this linear transformation. OK? 
Okay. So this is the general definition of a derivative. It works for all dimensions. It works for you know things other than kind of linear vector uh, kinds of things. Uh, it just need to be vector spaces and a little bit more limits have to exist. So I learned this perspective uh, as an undergrad um, from a book called Calculus on Manifolds, M Michael Spivak, it's 1965. It's a beautiful little gem of a book um, that gets right to the heart of what differentiation is about. Okay. Now, as I mentioned, there are all these different representations of derivatives. Each of them have their own chain rule, okay? But really, those chain rules all mean the same thing, okay? They're all, they all have some form of multiplication. You can multiply two scalars together. You can uh, multiply two uh, vectors uh, in one sense, and you get a dot product. In a different sense, you get what's called an outer product, so inner and outer products. Uh, or if they're matrices, you get matrix products. But all of those notions of products represent the same thing, which is composition of linear maps. So the general, the one unifying general chain rule is the following. It says the derivative of a composition of two functions, g compose f, at a is, well, we're going to take the derivative of f at a and the derivative of g at f of a, okay, and the derivative of f at a, the derivative of g at f of a, and we're going to compose them. So normally you would see, instead of composition, you'd see some kind of multiplication here. But that multiplication is there because it uh, correctly implements a composition. The real one single story is composition. Yeah. If you go one back, when, when you show the linear function, yeah. you know, that you're saying like normally that's what you get as a, as a already implemented as a map, a linear map, like a matrix or, or something. Right? Yeah, so the representation of that function. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So right. abstractly, we have a linear transformation from A to B. Concretely, it might have a matrix okay. that represents the linear transformation. Yeah. But the important thing is, if you think in terms of representations, it's like, oh, is it a matrix? Is it a vector? Is it this kind of vector or the other kind of vector? And so on. Um, and, and, and normally, like linear algebra packages, you know, software libraries, they'll have, they'll have some matrix package, and it has all these unsafe operations. Like, you multiply two matrices, and, well, they have to conform. The, the width of one has to be the same as the height of the other, and so on. And the type systems usually don't give that to you. But if you say linear transformations, the type system gives you the domain and codomain. You cannot have a type-correct program that tries to multiply uh, matrices that don't fit. For instance, moreover, by talking about it abstractly, and this is really key to this talk, we can innovate and use different representations, not a matrix representation, because a matrix representation actually turns out to be a bad idea, even though it's just about universally adopted. OK. So uh, this form of composition is sequential composition. But there's another kind, which is parallel composition. Okay. So if, if you have two functions and the, uh, the output of one matches the input of the others, you can sequentially compose them. But there's another form, which is you have two functions and they have the same domain. They have the same input. So one, get, one takes you from A to C, the other takes you from A to D. You can fuse those functions together into one that gives you the pair of results. And it's a very simple definition. We call this fork. So the fork of f and g, when you apply it to a, well, you give a to each of the functions and you pair up the results. <laughs> so logically, this is uh, parallel. When I say parallel, I don't mean operationally. I don't mean it runs in parallel. It's a good idea for it to run in parallel, yeah, but that's a separate issue. I mean, semantically, there's no data dependencies, mm -hmm. whereas sequential composition is, is all about data dependencies. Parallel composition is free of them. Okay. So these two forms of composition are both important. And this is something that the Learn differentiation, especially automatic or symbolic differentiation. It's said that uh, that you know these methods are all about the chain rule. They're not all about the chain rule. The chain rule is only about sequential composition. They have other clumsy ways that they typically talk about parallel composition. But we can talk about them really elegantly in terms of this one notion, and we'll get a lot of mileage out of making uh, these kind of single general definitions. Okay. So let's go back to sequential composition. The chain rule, uh, you probably learned uh, in, in high school, except in this uh, generalized form. <clears throat> so there's a problem with the chain rule if we're thinking about how to implement something. We want to do implementation. We want to be able to reason about it. We uh, want it to be you know, correct uh, and opt be optimizable, that kind of thing. Well, it's a huge help for the algorithm to be compositional. <clears throat> what I mean by compositional is whatever operation I'm performing, <clears throat> like differentiation, of a composition I form by taking the derivative of each of the two functions and then somehow combining them. All right. Well, the chain rule doesn't work that way. <clears throat> the chain rule isn't compositional. And then if you look at the, the definition here, the derivative of a composition is, well, it involves the derivative of, G, of f and g, but it also involves f itself. Okay. So this is going to be, this is going to be kind of uh, awkward to talk about in terms of reasoning and implementing compositionally. But there's a simple fix. And the fix is, instead of computing just the derivative, 
So you get this function from A to B, and, and, and we get back a function from A that not only computes its derivative, but also the original value. Okay? That's it. This enhanced specification is compositional because uh, when you write out the, the implications of it, the uh, co computing the function and its derivative uh, for f and g involves just f and g and its derivatives. So you mean the b on the right side is the same as the b computed by the function exactly, on the left-hand yeah. side? Exactly. Oh, the left-hand side? But that function, uh -huh. so the, it gives you a b. Yeah. Is that b the same b? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. So all we're doing, yeah. And here's the definition, specification. So I'm using this fork operator. I didn't need to do that. So it says that this enhanced derivative of f is f itself right. and the derivative of f. That's all. Just, just don't forget f. That's all this is saying. This one fix makes, the, makes uh, differentiation compositional, and, and automatic differentiation does this. Okay, I mean, you, you can find this in any automatic differentiation because you have to to make it compositional. All right. So... There's one other really lovely uh, result from this perspective, this calculus on manifolds or derivatives as linear maps, and that's the, that's the following. The derivative of a linear function is itself everywhere. Okay? So that may sound weird, but if you think about what derivatives really mean, derivatives are all about linear approximations. So when you have the derivative of a function at a point, what you're saying is, well, we know what the, we know what the, the value of the function is, Okay, but if we also know the first derivative, so the, like the tangent at that point, that tangent is, a, is linear, it's a, and it's a local linear approximation. Right at that point, it's exactly correct. As it moves away from the point, it's slightly incorrect, and the further you get away, it's more, it's more and more incorrect. If you want to get a closer approximation, you could use a first and second derivative. Then you get some kind of local quadratic approximation. It's going to be a much better approximation, so on. But for differentiation, for first derivatives, <laughs> differentiation is all about making linear approximations. So when I say the derivative of a linear function is itself everywhere, all I'm saying is that linear functions are, are their own perfect linear approximations. It's really like nothing. It's like completely obvious. Okay. Now, this is something you know without knowing it. If you say, like, what's the derivative of, of uh, x with respect to x, you'd say it's 1. Or uh, 2x with respect to x, you'd say it's 2. So, but I just told you, no, the derivative is the function itself. And that's because when we say the derivative of, of, of the function, you know, x goes to x is 1, it's not 1. It's the linear transformation that multiplies by 1. Okay which is the same as the identity function. So the derivative of the identity is the identity, is the general way of saying it. Sometimes it looks like if you, if you have scalar functions, you might say it's one. If you have non-scalar functions, you might say it's the identity matrix. Okay, The identity matrix, so the matrix that's ones on the diagonal and zeros elsewhere, that's just a representation of the identity function. Okay, So similarly, the first and second, these are functions that take a pair and give you the first or second element. Those are linear also. So those functions are their own derivatives also everywhere. And in general, if you take the derivative of a linear function f at a, you get, well, f of a and f itself. That's the derivative. Okay. All right. So now I've really shown you automatic differentiation. I mean, it's all here. If, if you take primitive operations, addition, multiplication, sine, cosine, and so on, and we know what their derivatives are, Okay, just look them up, remember them, or prove them analytically. And then you start composing things in parallel and in sequence. And then we have all the, we have all the linear functions, in it, which is the, you know, the easy case. This is all there is to automatic differentiation. So if you read the literature, especially what's called reverse mode, which is what's used in machine learning, extremely complex. But it's because it's almost, because it has all this historical baggage. It's because it was invented... It was invented a long time ago, uh, uh, in the 50s or 60s, uh, and then reinvented by machine learning people, re rediscovered uh, in terms of something called backpropagation. But it wasn't from this kind of uh, heritage of, of uh, you know, crisp uh, mathematical specifications and, uh, and rigorous developments. Okay? So if you get rid of all the kind of historical accidental baggage, um, graphs and variables and layers and things like that, the essence really is just what I've shown you. And we can now put these pieces together into automatic differentiation. And then we're done. Not really, because I'm going to show you some improvements. So what I want to talk about here is now is a nice way to package up this information. So I said we have linear functions. And we have, uh, there'll be some primitives, sine, cosine, and so on. And then uh, sequential and parallel composition. Okay. Now, if you take those, those are the basic building blocks, those building blocks have a mathematical uh, history to them. Okay, the, we, we can take those operations, we can take the identity and composition, and that notion, there's an algebraic notion, it's called the category, 
I don't expect anybody to have a category theory background, but just uh, uh, yeah, it's just the idea of uh, I've got some thing, which you can think of as a function-like thing. I mean, there's a domain and codomain. It doesn't really have to be a function-like thing, um, but you can think of it that way. And uh, so that's going to be this guy. So this will be something like functions, and it has two things, identity and composition. In the identity, maps something to itself. Composition takes a, something from B to C and A to B and gives you an A to C. Okay? So this is a generalization of the idea of the identity function and composition on functions. And there are certain laws. This is algebra. So there are certain laws, which is for here just that uh, composition is associative. And the identity is the right and left identity for composition. Those, that's all. So anything that satisfies, it has these kind of operations, satisfies those laws as a category. That's what, that's what category means. Okay. But now there are some additional operations. So in addition to category, we might have, there's this um, uh, more specialized notion of a Cartesian category. And all that means is there's a, it has a notion of products, of pairs. Okay. And there are three operations. <clears throat> One is extract left. The yeah, other is extract right. That's what I was calling first and second before. Okay, so given a pair, you can get the first element. Given a pair, you can get the second element. And then there's fork, which is two, two of these uh, funny arrows with the same domain, and you get another one with that domain but a pair as a result. So I've already, I've already talked about these operations on functions, and I'm just saying there's actually a wider context, not just mathematical functions or computable functions as we use in, in, the, in computer science and software engineering. And this will be really important because, <clears throat> because automatic differentiation is all, about one of, is all about one of these things that's not exactly a function. It's a differentiable function. It's a function that computes with derivatives as well. Okay? And then there'll be some other interfaces. So this, this is Haskell-looking uh, stuff, but I hope you get the idea. It's talking about two different interfaces. <clears throat> one specializes the other, so it makes additional restrictions. Uh, and they have laws. Uh, the laws here say things like if you take two, two of these uh, arrows, you... you combine them, and then you follow, you compose with, uh, say, extract left, then you get out the original one. It's that kind of thing. There's like nothing surprising at all. Okay. So now I've shown you all the building blocks of automatic differentiation, and then I've shown you an interface, which is a common interface not specific to automatic differentiation. It's one that's, that's you know, come out of algebra, <clears throat> particularly in the uh, 50s, I think, 1950s, that is. Uh, and now I'm just going to put all the pieces together. And this is a Haskell program. Uh, if, any, if you don't understand what something means, please, please interrupt. Um, <clears throat> all right, so we're going to go back to our specification. And I've tweaked it a little bit. So I said we're going to define this type. Okay, it's a type of differentiable functions from A to B. So that's D, A, B. And this is a Haskellism. It just says that, that uh, uh, one of these guys, differentiable function from A to B, has this representation. It's a function from A to a pair of B and a linear map from A to B. Exactly what I showed you before. But now I've just made this little D thing here, which is a, it just a wrapper. It's just something that, that says it's not, uh, the, you know, the type of this thing is not the underlying representation. It's this more kind of abstract notion. Okay. And now here's our specification. So this D hat, we're going to take a function from A to B and give you a D from A to B. And what does it do? Just what it did before. It takes F and its derivative, combines them into one, but now we wrap it up with a D. So this is just a little bit of just programming language uh, wrapping. And I want to emphasize here, this specification is not computable. Okay? So given an arbitrary computable function, even if it's continuous, even if it's differentiable in a mathematical sense, it's not computable to construct its derivative. So that's, that's not a like, shallow result. Um, so it's uh, what I l one of the things that I really like about this, uh, what I'm sharing with you today, is, is that we start with an extremely simple, compelling specification. I'm saying, we just take the function and, and its derivative, mathematical derivative, not, not a computable derivative. A simple specification, and then we're going to go through a process of, uh, well, I'll show you the outline of it. You can read the paper for details, of transforming the specification into an implementation. So we get something that's not computable, very simple and compelling. We end up with something that's efficiently computable. Okay? And not only that, but it's automatable. That is the transformation. All right, so here's the specification. Uh, so what we're going to do is automatic differentiation. I'm going to organize the code as instances of these classes, um, category and Cartesian, and a few other things for sine and cosine and so on. Okay? And the specification is to say that this not computable function, d hat, preserves the Cartesian, preserves the category and Cartesian structure. Here's what I mean. It's just these five equations. Okay? Two from the category interface and three from the Cartesian interface. So Cartesian just means about products. 
category just means about identity and composition. So what we're saying is that this d hat of the identity is the identity. d hat of g compose f is the composition of uh, the d hats of g and f. Okay. The left extractor goes to itself, goes to itself in the other category. And that's the important thing. On the right-hand side, to see this uh, this id is functions. That id is differentiable functions. It's d. Okay. This composition is on functions. This one is on differentiable functions on d, and so on. So the derivative of the fork is the fork of the derivative, and so on. So this is an extremely simple specification. It's a very compelling form. What that means is, um, is you can really think about differentiable functions just in terms of this specification. Okay? And that your, any intuition you form about what does it mean when I'm composing these two things is captured you know, precisely and elegantly by these five, uh, law, these five uh, requirements. So these requirements are going to be the specification. And then, we're going to, and then the, the, the trick is to derive a correct implementation that's computable. It's an actual implementation. OK, so that's the game. Wanna... Yes? So, so D Thanks. hat is a functor? So, yes. It's a functor? Yes, it's a Cartesian functor. Yeah, so it, it, so more generally, it's a homomorphism. So if, if, if we have we have uh, these um, um, abstract notions, for instance, category and Cartesian, they have a vocabulary: identity, compose, extract, left, right, fork. What we're saying is that D is a is a is compositional over that structure, or it distributes over that structure. Or it's a homomorphism over that structure. Or it's also called a, a functor and a Cartesian functor. So the identity um, identity <coughs> in the image. Is this A goes to A plus A linear A, which is your definition of identity at a that? Yeah. Yeah, so this is this is the regular identity function. That's the differentiable identity function, which means it knows how to compute a value and its derivative. Yeah, and so on. All of them are like that. So this is the general game. I'm gonna play this game over and over, so it's, it's kind of important to <coughs> pause and appreciate uh, what's going on. Simple specification very regular, uh, sorry, simple uh, uh, definition of a function and of the specification that's always of this form, that the, uh, this kind of simple compelling definition is it distributes over the structure, it preserves the structure, or it's a functor in the category language. Okay, so if we take these five equations and we solve them, right, it's an algebra problem. So we solve these five equations, we get this result. Now, how do, how, you know, how do I get this result? It's in a paper called uh, Simple Essence of Automatic Differentiation. Um, and it really just follows from the chain rule, the fork rule, uh, which I haven't shown you, um, and, uh, and the, the linearity, the property that linear functions are learned derivatives everywhere. And then a few special things. We know the derivative of negation, addition, and so on. Okay, so if you solve those equations, you get this form. I'm just going to show you what this looks like uh, operationally. So, for instance, the um, so this is the one that says if f is a linear function, okay, then the differentiable form d is a function that takes a and gives you f of a and then a. I could have written that differently as just f fork const f, where const is the thing that whatever argument you give it gives you f back. All right. So, for instance, if you look at how composition works, there's really two things in here because we said we're the, the 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 meaning of uh, the specification d hat is we're going to have the original function, and then simultaneously compute its derivative. So that's exactly what we do here. So uh, we compose the differentiable versions of g and f. We get differentiable function at a. Well, what do we do at a? We take f of a, and we get its value b and the derivative. So remember these guys, g computes a uh, function and its derivative, oh, sorry, f and g. Then we take a and put it into g, and we get c. Okay? That's going to be the final result of the function, but we also get a derivative there. And here we are using the composition of the functions, the result, and then we compose the derivatives. And this is the chain rule. So all I did is I just took the chain rule and the definition, did a little inlining, wove the code together. And then fork is, is quite similar. But uh, there are no data dependencies. So fork the, the two uh, derivatives and values are computed completely independently and then combined. And then for you know, basic operations, negation and addition are linear. Okay, so we can just use the general linear. So is identity. So are the extract left and right. That's why these ones were simple. Multiplication is not linear. So OK, there's a little more here. So multiplication is, well, we're going to take multiplication itself, that operation. Uh, but we also need its derivative. So the multiplication function at the argument a and b, 
I'm multiplying A by B. Well, that's going to give you a linear map. And that linear map is going to take a delta A and a delta B. And then it's going to scale B by delta A and A by delta B and add them. And this is what's called the Leibniz rule, the rule for products differentiation. Okay, so that's really, that's it. That's automatic differentiation. Where do you get your, your DA and DB from? Uh, like this. So, um, so think about a linear map. There are different ways to think about linear maps, and that's kind of the heart of this talk which we'll get to. A simple way to think about linear maps is they're just functions that happen to be linear. Okay, so, so uh, the derivative at a point a, b is going to give you a, a function that is linear. That function is, well, it's a function from delta a, delta b. So, so this whole thing is the linear map. All right? And if you look, yes, it's linear in dA and dB. Yeah, I'm thinking how you would normally represent this. Yes. Like, like that would be, yes. it, 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 it would basically uh, fill in all the possible values in the, in the, in the well. Yeah. So, typically, yeah. So there are different ways to represent linear maps, and 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 uh, and we're going to talk about them. That there's some kind of traditional ways and some non-traditional ways that work really well. So, so you gave um, instantiations that <coughs> that satisfy the equations for the previous slide. Uh, so what are you asking about the? So 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 these instances ah, yes. they satisfy the equations. Exactly. Now. Uh, Oh, so, so the, what the remark was, uh, these definitions here, these, in, these definitions which are organized in instances, they satisfy this specification. They are a solution to these equations. Yeah. But if, if, if you have polymorphic functions, then aren't they some of the solutions you need? Oh, you're asking about, are, are there some maybe some deep type theoretic or denotational yeah, properties? Yeah, there's type theory to say, okay, there's only one function that's the other. Okay, to. so the, the, <clears throat> the remark is, sometimes if, when you're in pure functional programming, in a, in a strongly uh, a, a typed, but more than that, in a parametrically polymorphically typed a setting, there are certain um, inferences you can make that are valid that depend only on the type information. And, and uh, are these, for instance, one of them, could these have been uh, kind of automatically determined just based on the types? I don't know. Um, you know, it's, uh, they're not fully polymorphic because they require vector space structure. And so the, this property is called parametricity, which is kind of a, a deep property. Um, it, it's not as evidently applicable, but it doesn't mean it's not applicable. So, so, so it doesn't apply to the Lottie pop, is that what you're saying? It doesn't apply to what? The Lottie pop. Oh, um, yeah, well, so the lollipop or the, the linear map uh, types, it, 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 that's, a, um, that's not a fully general construction. It requires the notion of vector spaces, or at least modules, when it's called, it's a generalization. Um, so, you know, sometimes in the presence of uh, these certain algebraic constraints, there are still interesting free theorems. Uh, I have no idea whether there are free theorems that, you know, that relate to automatic differentiation, even to the like, extent that you're suggesting, which is maybe this whole thing is a free theorem. That would be very cool. And I really don't know. There's something that's, uh, to me, very compelling and sort of inevitable about this development. And that may be a clue that there's actually a free theorem. It's maybe easier, uh, in a sense, than, than I think it is simpler. All right. Now I want to show you some examples. And then we're going to get into uh, uh, you know, thinking about the performance characteristics of this simple algorithm uh, and how we can improve them. All right. So. I start out with these these three simple running examples. This is Haskell code. I'll, I'll talk you through it. If uh, if I don't you know if I don't explain something that you'd like to explain, please ask. So here is a, a squaring function. So we're saying this the squaring function square of a is a times a. Just defining this function. Well, its type is it goes from some type a to a. Sorry, this is a kind of common pun we do in Haskell programming where we name the variables and the types the same things. That may be a little confusing. Uh, and a just has to be numeric for this to make sense. So it could be ints and you know, floats and doubles and, and other things, complex numbers and uh, maybe higher dimensional things, even functions and so on. All right, but you can just think of these as being a real number, A here. A little bit more uh, sophisticated function, this uh, magnitude squared. So if you have a pair, A cross A, right, this is a pairing, uh, magnitude squared is, it's just the sum of the squares of the components. So what do we do? We take the pair AB and we square A and square B and add them. This is a little bit you know, a little less trivial example. And here's another one, which is uh, the cosine and sine of a product of two numbers. So given x, y, we're going to compute the sine and the cosine of z. And what is z? It's the product of x and y. Okay. Now, why these three examples? Because they get to scalar versus non-scalar in different interesting ways. 
Uh, this is a purely scalar function. This one takes a non-scalar, uh, has a non-scalar domain. This one has a non-scalar domain and codomain, both. Okay. All right. Now, we can take these expressions, this is simple, you know, it's a pure functional program, and rewrite them in categorical vocabulary. Okay, well, this is a big step, and it's kind of an important step. Um, uh, you may or may not be familiar with this, that, that um, there's a deep, deep connection among uh, the foundations of mathematics, in particular this, this approach of category theory on the one hand, uh, of logic, and not just one logic, but logics in general. So, uh, you know, what reason, I guess is another way to think of it, um, and uh, computation, okay? That at the heart of it, computation, reason, and the foundation of mathematics are all the same thing, okay? But that, but that connection, particularly between computation uh, and this foundational approach to mathematics, category theory, is, well, it's not so obvious in mainstream languages. So if you have an imperative language, if you've got like C-sharp or Java or, uh, I don't know, JavaScript, you know, worse, it doesn't even have, you know, uh, static typing, that kind of thing. Well, this connection uh, to, to you know, the essence of, of mathematics and category theory in particular is, is quite obscured. Um, it's there, it's just hard to see in all the, all the noise. But if you take a, a, a very kind of elegant, pure, simple, rigorous uh, notion of uh, programming, namely the typed lambda calculus, then there's a very clear uh, connection between the two. Okay? So uh, I'm not saying that only functional programming corresponds to you know, logic and, uh, and category theory. I'm just saying that, that in that setting, it's most clearly evident. Okay, because functional program is is equally expressive to uh, you know imperative programming, object oriented, whatever flavor you want. Okay, but this connection is quite uh, simple in this setting of, of type lambda calculus, and this is just a sugaring of the type lambda calculus. Haskell is just type lambda calculus sugared. That's eh, a little more than that, but it's essentially that. So. Um, there's a, as a result from 1980 that, that uh, uh, by uh, Joachim uh, Lambic, uh, which says that, that uh, if you take the type lambda calculus, there are different models of it. There are different interpretations of it. Okay? So the one that I'm used to, because I've been doing computer programming for a while, is computable functions. So I think these, this code, the lambda calculus, this code, it means computable functions. Okay? But what Lambic showed in 1980 is, no, that's just one interpretation that there are a lot of interpretations that are consistent with the, uh, with the laws of the lambda calculus, and they're exactly the, um, uh, the inhabitants, uh, they're exactly the models that, that have a mathematical property, namely that they are the Cartesian closed categories. Okay? So I haven't said what closed means. Closed means you have first class functions. Okay? Categories means you have identity and composition. Cartesian means you've got the first and second projections, the left and right projections, and this kind of fork operation. Okay. Close means you have a notion of first class functions. Anything that, that, that has those, that, that satisfies those interfaces, and I've already shown you what two of them look like, and that satisfy the laws, every one of those things is a, is a consistent model of the type lambda calculus. So a way that you can think of that is every one of those is a valid, sensible interpretation of a purely functional language like Haskell. Okay. And moreover, there's a, there's a, um, uh, we know how to automatically convert the lambda calculus into this language. So that's the idea here, um, is that we're going to write in Haskell. We're going to uh, automatically, so not the programmer, the compiler automatically translates to this vocabulary. And then instead of interpreting this vocabulary in the usual sense, in computable functions, it'll, inter it'll interpret it in some unusual sense. And in our case, it's the differentiable functions. That's the game. If you say automatic um, transformation from, from Haskell to category three, uh, I noticed that you inline the square function here. Um, do you need to do that in a global transformation and break mod modular boundaries? Or? No, thanks. Uh, so the, the question is, um, well, first it was an observation that, hmm, uh, I, I translated square here, but then I didn't just use square, which, which I could have. Now, this is purely a, kind of just where the implementation is at this point. Um, is a little awkward at this point for me to for me to uh, to preserve that modularity, but there's nothing. Hmm? No, yeah, there's no deep reason. There's nothing. Yeah, yeah. So so instead, this would look like uh, multiplication composed. Uh, so it would be square composed with exl, and that would be square composed with exr, and that would be more readable and more modular. Yeah, yeah. Just not quite there yet. All right. So for squaring, what do we do? Is well, we take the identity function and itself together, fork them together, that makes, that's a function that you give it A and it gives you A and itself. 
It just duplicates it. That's the duplicating function. And then we compose that with multiplication. So you take a value, duplicate it, and then, and then you take the product of that pair. Well, that's squaring. Okay. What do we do here? Well, we take the left extractor n itself. That gives us x out of xy. And then we, when we take it forked with itself, we get xx. Right? And we multiply that. So that's x squared. And this is y squared. We do those in parallel, and then we add the result. Let's see, this is compose. So you read from right, right to left. And cosine sine product is even simpler. You take the product and then in parallel the sine, the cosine and sine. So, so um, what I'm saying is uh, we already know how to take derivatives if we write our programs in this vocabulary. And that's what the previous slide shows. Okay. So if we take these definitions of the operations, like id, compose, fork, and so on, and we, and we use those interpretations here, we'll get versions of these functions that compute not only the regular values, but their derivatives exactly. All right. But this is a terrible language for a person to have to write in. It's a wonderful language for a compiler or a mathematician to reason about, but it's a terrible language for a programmer to write in. Okay. So fortunately, we have this automatic translation from a kind of human-friendly language, maybe debatable, uh, to a sort of you know, mathematically austere and easy, easy to reason about language. All right. So now I want to show you some uh, examples of this interpretation applied uh, in, for automatic differentiation. So here again is the magnitude squared function, okay, sum of the squares. And here's its categorical translation. I just mean this is exactly the same thing, but rephrased. And this is automatic, this step. And now if we interpret, uh, what have we done here? Oh yeah, so this isn't differentiation. This, this is just the function itself. So this is, uh, this is what the categorical expression looks like. Uh, this function we can visualize in terms of a graph, and this is what it looks like. So this kind of emphasizes the parallel nature of fork here. That's this fork right there. Okay. So what do we got? Here, here's, the, here's the extract uh, left, and it's getting fed in, both of them, to multiply. That's this one. Also, uh, the right extractors get fed into another multiply. These two in parallel, their results, they take the same argument, and their results uh, get fed in uh, to addition. All right. So um, what do I want to say here? Oh, yes. All right. Oh, in fact, um, there are three different categories going on here. Okay. One category is the one that I think we just apply unconsciously, at least I do, which is just to see, think that this means functions, plain old mathematical functions or computable functions. That's the usual one we have in terms of thinking of programming. This display here, this categorical expression, well, the expression in terms of this funny category language, it's another category itself. So, so I, have, I have a category that, it, that interprets composition as, well, in a syntactic sort of way, multiplication. It makes all the operations sort of syntactic. And then it pretty prints the result. Okay, That's just for my convenience. Another category, uh, it, uh, it, it builds a graph. Okay, And then I display that graph here. Okay. And then another category is the, is the derivative one, the differentiable one, which, I, which I'm going to show you next. Okay. But the important thing I want to say here is, uh, is what? Um, oh, yeah. Automatic differentiation is almost always talked about in terms of graphs, mm -hmm. okay? especially in machine learning, especially in reverse mode. Okay? And I think that's always a mistake okay? because, uh, because differentiation has nothing to do with graphs. Automatic differentiation is about differentiation. Differentiation is about functions. There's no graphs there. Okay. So you can think about any domain of interest anytime you're doing programming and you, you've got, well, there's some kind of compositional thing going on, some kind of algebraic something or other. I have very expressive, which is, of course, we want. We want our APIs to be expressive. It means you, you kind of use them multiple times and you feed the output of one operation to the input of another, that kind of thing. Every API you can think of as being about graphs. Arithmetic is an API. Okay. Addition, multiplication, and just like literal numbers is an API that you learned as a young child. And you can think of it as being about graphs, but it's not. No, uh, no. Uh, well, unless you're really doing graph theory or something like that, uh, it's not about graphs. It's about its domain. That domain has a vocabulary. It hopefully has a type system that mediates how you, what gets composed with what. You can think of those things as graphs, but you shouldn't. A compiler writer thinks about them as graphs. A graph theorist, maybe, might want to think about them as graphs. But differentiation has nothing to do with graphs. So I want to make that point because it, it distinguishes this work from uh, almost all other AD work that I know, especially reverse mode. 
Um, but I also want to say, you're going to see a lot of graphs, and you might be tempted to think I'm doing something like these other systems, TensorFlow or something that's all hung up on graphs. I think, no, no, no. These graphs are just about visualization. They have nothing to do with automatic differentiation. Even when I show you the result of automatic differentiation as a graph, the graph came second, not first. Meaning it's, it's, a, it's a way for me to show you the result, not a way to compute the, the derivative. Okay, so here's an AD example. I'll make it a little simpler. This is the squaring function. This is the uh, expression in this category language, and this is a graph that just uh, shows you uh, shows you what the computation looks like. All right. Now, uh, what I get here is this is the derivative of the differentiable function version. So if I take this expression and interpret it in this uh, category of differentiable functions that I showed you, and then I take the resulting uh, function on the, in, uh, the inside, the representation of this, and I turn it into a, a, a graph. I, I, I reinterpret it uh, as a graph. This is the result we get. So this is the original function. So that's a, that's a squared, right? a times a, and that's the first result. The second result is going to be a function that's linear. And the way I'm showing functions here is just a little green box and the input is, so in is the input and out is the output of the function. So what do we have here? This is a, this is the linear function that takes, I'm going to call it dA, okay? It's just a little delta. So we get a times dA times 2, all right? So this is the linear map that maps dA to 2a dA. You're used to thinking of that as the, the derivative is 2a, the derivative of a squared is 2a. It's not. It's a, it's dA times 2a, okay? That's a linear function. It's a function from dA that multiplies dA by uh, 2a. When we say the derivative of a squared is 2a, that's what we mean. It means multiply by 2a because it's linear, okay? Here's a little more sophisticated example, the sum of two squares, okay? This is the categorical uh, expression, and when we interpret these operations in the, the differentiable function category, we get this result, again, we're going to compute the original function here. So this is what a, b. So that's a squared, b squared, and we're adding them. That's the first result. And the second one is the derivative. So it's going to take a da, db. And here we get, what is this? this is, uh, da times b. That's uh, b. This is a times db. Let's see, what is this one? This is b times b times d b. That's not right. B. <laughs> okay, I gotta look at that. Um, so we, sh we should get two. Oh yes, so of course, that's exactly right. Yeah. So never mind what I was saying. Um, yeah, this this is correct. My brain was incorrect. This is a da times a, doubled. So this is two a da. This is two b db. We're gonna add them. Okay. That's that's the linear map. All right. So, so it, there's no real magic here, right? You define no, the no primitives. Mm -hmm. Maybe like. Cosine is special, so you do this once. Yeah. And after that, you just compose the exactly. the D guy. So that's it's a little bit of a button. Exactly. Right. right. Yeah. There's no magic. There's no. Here. No. Right. Yeah. So except for the primitives. Yeah. Just to feed well, yeah. So then it's composition. Yeah. So we have to know derivatives for for our primitives, and then and then every composing form, of which there are two main ones, sequential and and, and parallel. Yeah, we have to know how, how we compose these differentiable functions. And that's it. That's all there is to automatic differentiation. Okay. Yeah, yeah we're, thank you. I want to emphasize the simplicity of what's going on here, particularly in contrast to the complexity of what goes on in the literature about automatic differentiation, particularly what's called reverse mode, which is the mode that's needed for machine learning and other uses of uh, uh, high dimensional optimization problems. Okay. Yeah. Um, how would you deal with uh, sums? And I'm thinking about like discontinuities and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so some types. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, um, so I've shown you how to, um, uh, what, uh, we can deal with scalars and we can deal with products. All right. So what about when we have some types or disjoint unions, that kind of thing? Um, and there are, there's a, you know, there are a few angles on the question, but the, I think the first most fundamental question is, does differentiation even meaningful? Because uh, once, once you have some types, you no longer can have purely continuous functions. Well, you can, but none of them are interesting, right? They would have to always be the left or the, the mm -hmm. right uh, disjunct of the sum, right? So um, uh, I don't know. I'm going to show you something that is similar, but you know, interestingly different from sums. But your question, yeah, is really about sums. Um, it's something I've thought about. Um, I think there's probably a really lovely answer 
and I don't know what it is. I mean, I suppose in some way you can church and go to some and fit inside your system, but, but yeah. what, what does it look like at the end of the day? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so Mark, you can church encode, though you can represent, so some, sometimes it is like disjoint unions, it's either that or that, plus a tag, something that tells you which it is. So even when you add like, uh, it's a real or a real, you still get to know which real, the left one or the right one. Uh, that's, what, that's what makes it a disjoint union. Um, I forgot your remark. What was it? <laughs> what, if you, I mean, you could church encode a sum. Ah, yes, church encode. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so these types can be encoded in terms of functions. Actually, even pairs can be encoded in terms of functions. But actually, that's not enough. You need universals as well. You need universal quantification. Yeah. And with universal quantification then you, and function, then you can get uh, pairs and sums. But I don't know, what, like if you encoded even products, before we get to sums, encode products in that way, um, what happens to the notion of differentiability? Does it just kind of ride along in a sensible way with the church encoding? That's a really interesting question. Um, if the answer is yes, then it will be encouraging to try the same thing with sums. It might get to the same uh, around the parametricity issues that Nikolai Yeah, yeah, it might. So, yeah, these are interesting questions. <clears throat> And you know, that question. So it's basically that the church encoding is an instance of a continuation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and we'll get yeah. into that. So, oh, so we have continuations. Yeah, yeah, we'll get continuations. Yeah. All right. For, for church encoding, you need like rank two types, and yeah. which correspond to cones in category theory. So maybe we would need to extend your, your theory. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What I love about this framework of thinking about automatic differentiation, and not just that, but a lot of different problems, a, a lot of different. Uh, problems that we can re-examine in, in terms of this uh, language or the setting of category theory. Um, what I love is that the, spe the specifications are so simple, right? So if, if, if I was trying to start from back propagation, as it's described in the machine learning literature or the AD liter literature, it would, like, I wouldn't have a prayer. It's like, I don't even understand what this algorithm, you know, it, it, I don't understand it, its meaning or, or whether it's correct or not. Uh, without introducing these, you know, complications. But when we get it to this really simple foundation, then we can revisit these questions. Yeah, what if you do church encoding? What if you do sums? Uh, what if you uh, don't, aren't happy with the uh, performance? You know, you get out of here and you want a reason. Can you, uh, so, so the, uh, your objective is you're given a circuit, an arithmetical circuit, and you want to differentiate it? I'm given a met, that er, I'm given a function, not a circuit. Okay, but there was some reason you wanted it. Okay, yeah. So I'm given a. Uh, you're, um, you're, given, you're given a representation of an arithmetic function. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. And, and, and your your objective is to compile it, compile the derivative. Yes. And optimize it. Yep. That, okay. That's that's your end goal. Yeah. So okay. so let me let me uh, <clears throat> repeat the question. Um, is is my goal here to to take a description of a mathematical function and generate code that computes its derivative? Correctly and efficiently. Is that that's the question, yeah, right? I, I, and the answer is yes. That's yes. Your real goal. yes, that's exactly my goal. Now, so, it, it is a kind of important distinction. We're given uh, a representation of a mathematical function. Given a mathematical function itself, it's not computable. You can't compute its derivative. But given a representation, yeah. So there are different representations you might choose. A popular one is graphs. What I'm saying is that's always a bad idea compared with this much simpler setting of saying, oh, we're going to take the lambda calculus. Moreover, that, that's just a starting point. What's really much more convenient is this categorical expression. Unfortunately, we can automatically translate. And that step has nothing to do with differentiation. There's also this term symbolic differentiation. Yes. Is it different? I mean, I, I understand it more in the, the, the numerical Fortran programs. Yeah. But it seems, I mean, the, the, the high-level goal seems identical. Uh, yes, it is, yeah. So if you read the AD literature, maybe some machine learning, uh, particularly the AD literature, a lot of papers start out by saying there are three different ways to compute derivatives on a computer. Mm -hmm. One is, as they call numeric or approximation method, or it's called the secant method or method of differences. Right. Those are all different terms of the same thing. And it, it's just, uh, you take a couple of points, hopefully near each other, you draw a line, you know, and you say that's roughly the derivative. Okay? Well, it's incorrect. Isn't that numerical derivative? Yeah, that's yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, but, but numeric is, yeah, people will call that numeric, but that's not a good description because automatic differentiation is numeric too. If you look at it one way, it's numeric. If you look at it another way, it's symbolic. So just call the first one numeric is a little misleading. Okay. Yeah, because you can say the difference between AD and some, I mean, automatic and symbolic differentiation is AD is numeric and symbolic is, is symbolic. But that's, that's a funny perspective. I think it's a quite popular perspective, but I, I don't think it's a very good one. Right. Well, because well, so it seems all symbolic. You're just you're just monkeying with symbols here, right? 
Every, so <laughs> it's one of these things yeah. that I would agree with you, except that um, what you're saying is true but misleading okay. in the following sense. So it's, it's, it's maybe factual, but it's not true um, in the following sense. Everything that is done by a compiler is symbolic. Sure. Okay, so to talk about something and say it's symbolic, it's a, no. If you're in a compiler, everything is symbolic. Once you're doing runtime, you can say everything is numeric. Well, okay. If your program is doing symbol manipulation, like symbolic differentiation, then then okay, it's not a very useful way to think of it as it's numeric. Of course, it is because it's using you know bit encodings of things, mm -hmm. but that's not a, that's not a very helpful yeah. perspective. Yeah, exactly. So everything is symbolic when done by a compiler. Automatic differentiation. This is what I say. Automatic differentiation is, ah, so sorry, the story is there are three ways to compute derivatives. One is incorrectly uh, num by numerical approximation. That's called the secant method or method of differences. Okay? That's very popular, but it's terrible performance-wise and uh, accuracy-wise. <clears throat> Another is what's called symbolic differentiation, which is you write code that does what you did in high school, which is like manipulate symbols. Oh, well, let's see, the derivative of sine u is cosine u du. And, and so you're writing something that, that is manipulating some representation of mathematical expressions. Okay? So that's typically called symbolic. And there's automatic differentiation, okay? which is what I'm showing you, which kind of uses the chain rule and so on. But, but from my perspective, that's, uh, I, don't think that's a, I don't think that's a very helpful description. I don't think it's true. Because it's higher level, you're saying it's more mathematical, that's why it's numerical. What I'm saying is that it's, it's really it, has, it, it has algebraic rules as, yeah. a, as opposed to organized when you reorganize code in a compiler. Mm. Yeah, what I'm really saying is this. Automatic differentiation is symbolic differentiation performed by a compiler. That's my perspective on, on the relationship between oh, okay. the two. Okay. So it's, it's, it, you won't find that statement in the literature. Okay. You'll, you'll find That's, these two are very different things. Automatic differentiation is a good one. Symbolic differentiation has all kinds of problems. Okay. I think what's true is, uh, is symbolic differentiation done badly has all kinds of problems. But that has nothing to do with symbolic differentiation. That has to do with doing things badly. Right? Mm -hmm. So don't do it badly. Simple. And in the context of a compiler, it's convenient to do it well. And so I'm doing, I'm doing symbolic differentiation. I'm tricking the compiler into doing symbolic differentiation. But no big deal, because the compiler does everything symbolically. I want it to have good performance. No big deal, because compilers are good at maintaining performance. Okay. So, so can, can I say that one difference with how, you, how people usually do symbolic differentiation is it may not work, right? You may write expressions that, that cannot be handled by the code? In your case, I'm, I'm guaranteed that if I write it within these limits, uh, it works out. Is, it, is that true? Or is it, yeah, so, again, so, it's so not a saying, it. Yeah, it's just factual and misleading. Yeah, so, <laughs> so if, if you do things symbolically, you can run into problems. If you do it, you know, here you can't run into problems. No, they're both, you can run into the same problems in either setting, which is if you try to express something outside of the vocabulary, of which, for which we know how to symbolically or automatically differentiate. Then we're going to run into problems. <clears throat> so maybe in one setting it's a little more convenient to restrict your expressiveness. Maybe I don't really know if it is. Okie doke. So here, here's the third example. The the uh, what is this? The uh, the sine and cosine of the product. Okay. This is the undifferentiated version. This is the differentiated version. Okay. And and what I want to show here is is that there's a lot of sharing of computation between the regular value, which is sometimes called the primal, <clears throat> and the derivative. Okay. Well, this is a small example, so there can't be a whole lot of sharing because there isn't a whole lot of computation going on. But this is crucial, and I forgot to mention this at first. This one step early on in the talk where I said uh, sequential composition, the chain rule, is not compositional, ironically, since it's about composition. Uh, and I made it compositional by augmenting the function with its derivative instead of just computing the derivative. That augmentation not only makes it compositional, it makes it possible to do compute it efficiently. And that's because the original definition of just the derivative, it uses the derivatives of functions and the regular value of functions. And usually there's a lot of shared computation between a function and its derivative. And so by, by putting them both into one specification, it makes it possible to optimize and share computation. Okay? And not only possible, it is quite easy, because I, I, mean, I showed you the code that shares. Okay? With, some, with what's called symbolic differentiation, sharing is a big deal. And the main criticism of symbolic differentiation is that, well, you don't get sharing. You end up doing like exponentially large work to compute or exponentially large work to optimize away the redundant work at, at runtime. So you usually do a huge amount of work at compile time or at runtime. All right? Um, that's just because people are used to doing symbolic differentiation badly. That's all. It's, 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 not a, it's not a problem with the symbolic approach. And as I said, 
this is symbolic, mm -hmm. but the compiler's doing it. And I don't even have to help the compiler be smart about sharing, because compilers are smart about sharing. That's their, part of their job. Yes, and compilers do that. When you say let, so the remark was mm -hmm. to turn a tree into a DAG. What I would say is stop thinking about graphs. Okay? So if you think about graphs, then you're going to run into this thing of, oh my god, it's easier to manipulate trees compositionally than graphs. Graphs are very awkward. Trees are super simple. It's like the simplest thing. <clears throat> so, oops, but some trees are, are exponentially larger than the graphs they represent. <clears throat> In other words, trees don't have sharing. You have to do duplication to represent the same thing. <clears throat> so you could be, you could think in terms of graphs, trees, Manipulation of graphs that kind of refactor big trees into, into graphs with more sharing. That's a lot of work and it's really complicated. Just don't create the problem in the first place. Don't think about trees and graphs because differentiation has nothing to do with trees and graphs. Okay. So I want to go back to this, um, uh, the, the Haskell code that, uh, that is derived by solving these uh, five equations, the, the um, structure preserving nature of the d hat operation. Okay. So this is the code I showed you a few slides ago. <clears throat> and I want to note that this is something that jumped out at me. When I first was working on this uh, differentiation in this category language, okay, I started noticing a pattern. And when I start noticing patterns, I like to, I like to write pretty code. So I tried to you know, pull those patterns out so I could really see what was going on. And I noticed the first one that really caught my eye is, well, this, the, what is it? The composition of differentiable functions involves the composition of derivatives. Okay? The identity function, differentiable function, involves the identity function. Uh, sorry, the identity linear map. Okay? So we got the identity, the differentiable identity function involves the identity linear map. That it is the derivative everywhere. The uh, differentiable, uh, the composition of differentiable function includes the, involves the composition of the derivatives of linear maps. So not only that, but that's all it needed. These definitions use nothing about linear maps other than that they have identity and composition mm -hmm. and that they satisfy the laws. Okay? So that was interesting. And then get into Cartesian. Oh, interesting. The, the left extractor involves the left extractor linear map. Okay? The right extractor and the fork involves the fork. And that's all it used. So this code is not only pretty and poetic, which is really how I got to it, but it says something very powerful, which is that we can, which is that linear maps, there's almost nothing you need to know about them. You need to know that they form a Cartesian category also. That means that every notion of every function-like thing that is a Cartesian category, and there's a lot of them, can play the role of linear maps. Okay? So this observation and writing the code, you know, with purely aesthetic motivations, it led to, uh, I think, a deep and very powerful insight, which is that automatic differentiation not only can be expressed elegantly, but, it's a, but much, much more generally than the, uh, you know, original specification. Okay. So that's the point here. Every one of these operations on differentiable functions just uses the corresponding operation on linear maps. And therefore, we can generalize, we place the role of linear maps by an arbitrary other thing that has identity, composition, projections, and fork, and satisfy the laws. Okay, so all I've done from this slide to this slide is I've parameterized this notion. So D here, it had linear maps built in. This D, the subscript says, it's going to take a parameter, it's going to take any old Cartesian category, for instance, linear maps, and use them here. And the definitions are unchanged. Well, I made one little change. Linear, I'm, I'm, I'm making a clear distinction between uh, uh, sort of linear D, it takes a function and its derivative. They're always going to be the same, like identity and identity, XL and XL. But one will be on functions and the other will be on, on the linear map-like thing. So the code really is unchanged except for this duplication just to make that distinction clear. <laughs> well, there's one awkward thing here. Negate and add are linear. Okay, so we're going to take just the linear versions of them. So here we are. See, this is the uh, extract left on functions. This is on, I want to say linear maps, but it's not just linear maps. It's arbitrary, uh, this notion here. But multiplication, well, that's awkward. I don't really have a way to talk about it because originally I wrote it this way, right? But this is functions. So this linear map, this is literally a function. So it's not kind of an arbitrary Cartesian category. Well, so 
Well, let's write this in another way. I'm going to suggest a couple of pieces of vocabulary, next tell you what they mean on functions, and then say we can generalize them also. Okay, and then we get another expression of a derivative of multiplication. Okay, so there are two things going on. One is scaling, okay, and the other is, well, we take a pair and we break it up. <clears throat> we do some computations and we add the results. Those are the two patterns that I want. So one of them is called scale. So scale of u is the linear function that multiplies its argument by u. Okay? So multiplication isn't linear. It's what's called bilinear. But when you provide one argument to multiplication, the result is linear. Okay? And then there's this operation that's, that's called, I'm calling uh, join. So remember fork, it took two functions, or two arrows, uh, of the same domain and, gave this, and, and, and took an argument, gave them to both, and then paired up the results. Join is the dual of that. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, yes, that's right. So j with join, we have two of these uh, maps with the same codomain, the same result. Okay? And, and possibly different arguments. So we're going to take a pair rather than generating a pair. So it's, it's, it's just a dual, a reverse of a, a fork. And what do we do? Well, we, uh, when you do join f and g, you, you get a pair. We parcel out the arguments, give one to f, one to g, and add the results. Okay? So that I'm calling join. This, with this vocabulary, we can just refactor this expression, and now we get this form. Lambda a, b, we're going to join scale by b with scale by a. So why is b first? Because it's b times dA, a times db. Okay. So now with this vocabulary, I haven't really made this any more general. I've just described it differently, but I've written, I've introduced a new vocabulary that does generalize. Okay. So here's the new vocabulary. We, had, uh, we have the category and the Cartesian forms, and now we have this co-Cartesian, and it gives three operations that are the dual, the reversal of the Cartesian operations. So instead of having two projections or extractors, we have two injections, left and right. And instead of taking two uh, arrows with the same domain, we take two with the same codomain. Okay, so this is the new vocabulary. And then one more thing, uh, 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 um, settings that know how to do scaling. Okay. All right. So now given this vocabulary, now we can write linear transformations as functions. So all I'm doing is I'm repackaging what I said before. So this is a little new type. This is just saying we're going to represent these additive functions as just regular old functions but with the context of additivity, thing that all the types involved are additive. Now, where that additivity comes in, I'm omitting from this slide, but it, it's in the paper. And the interesting new thing here is that we have this coach Cartesian operation. And so to inject from the, from the left, we add a zero on the right. To inject on the right, we add a zero on the left. And the join operation does the addition, parceling out an addition. And scaling just does multiplication. So with these definitions, now we get back to where we were before. We have, uh, we have essentially using functions to represent linear maps, but now we have this more elegant vocabulary. Okay. Now, now we can do something more interesting. Now we can change the representation. Instead of using functions as linear maps uh, to represent linear maps, we can use other representations. Why would we want to? What's wrong with using just functions? It's the simplest way to do it, but it has a problem. And, and here's the main one, is, is that sometimes we need to extract a data kind of representation from the linear map. Okay, so if we get a linear map, but it's represented by a function, I might need to do something like, well, a couple examples are, uh, one is um, if you're doing computer graphics uh, and you're doing uh, lighting and shading, so you've got some 3D model and a light source uh, and surface properties and so on, uh, to, to light a surface at a point, we need to know the normal vector. So you've got this surface and has, you can think of it as a tangent plane or a normal vector. And we're going to take a dot product between the normal vector and the vector between my eye and that point, or the light and the point, I guess. Okay, so how do we get uh, the normal vector? Well, we take the cross product of the, two, uh, of the two partial derivatives. Okay, so for that, we need a data representation. We need vectors. Okay. How do we get from a function that we know is linear to a compact data representation, a vector for it? Well, there's a simple way to do it, which is you take the function, as long as it's linear, you can sample it on a basis, okay? And, uh, and, and the, you know, the results you get you, um, uh, are the vector, okay? So you take, you take the function or, or the matrix. Take the, fun, uh, the function, if you know it's linear, sample it on a basis. What's a basis? Uh, for instance, take the identity matrix, all right? 
So the rows or columns, whichever you want to think about it, of the identity matrix, that forms the basis. So you apply the function to each of those vectors and the, you accumulate the results. That is the Jacobian matrix, the data representation. But it's terribly expensive in some settings. If, if the domain of that function, so that's what we're on a basis of, is high dimensional, say it's a million, and that's not atypical, that's quite typical for machine learning, so it's in the millions, then we're going to make a million by a million identity matrix. I'm going to million what's called one hot vectors, which is zero everywhere and a one somewhere, and pump them through this function. It's extremely expensive when you do quadratic work. All right, so this is not a viable approach, and this is why um, <clears throat> this is why we wouldn't want to represent um, if we're doing optimization problems, particularly if we have high dimensional uh, domains. We would not want to use functions of representation, okay, because it's just too expensive to extract a representation. Uh, Oh yeah, the other uh, another motivation besides computer graphics is just uh, search. Is is machine learning, like deep learning in particular. We want to do gradient descent. Well, what do we do? We need a, a gradient vector because that that's what tells us how that's what tells us in what direction to adjust the input when we're searching for a local minimum or maximum. All right. So, we could for an n-dimensional domain make n passes each on a one hot vector, very expensive. Um, and particularly expensive for gradient-based optimization, which is like the most valuable application of these ideas. So, it, 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 and ironically, we have we have a very low-dimensional codomain. The result it's one-dimensional. If we're doing optimization, we have a high dimension function that takes some high-dimensional input and gives you uh, an objective function value one. Okay, and unfortunately, the cost of converting the function representation depends on the dimension of the domain. It relies on the domain being small, but the domain is large, the codomain is small. So this, this is a serious problem. All right. So there's a solution, which is use matrices in the first place. Don't use functions to represent linear maps. Just use matrices. That's what everybody really does. All right. Well, uh, in a nice typed setting, there's a lovely and general way to think about that, which is that instead of thinking of a matrix as you know, like a row of columns, it's a two-dimensional rectangular thing, think of, no, it's a structure of structures. It's got a row structure and a column structure. You've got a structure of structures, and those structures are dependent on the domain type and the, and the codomain type. Okay, so that's what's going on here. I'm not going to go into this uh, in detail. But if, if, if you define a notion of a matrix-like thing, in a more general setting, and you define what it means to apply, one of the a matrix to uh, a vector, in other words, multiply the matrix by the vector. That gives us an algebra problem, too, of the same form, these five equations that say that, the, that this apply thing preserves structure. Okay? We can solve those equations, and, we, and what comes out of those equations is matrix multiplication and so on. Matrix multiplication is a solution to an algebra problem. Okay. I think I will skip over this part. This is just about these three pieces of vocabulary, scale, fork, and join, that is the vocabulary of matrices. If you think about matrices, every matrix right, is either a one by one, which means it's scaling, okay, or it's a horizontal or, or vertical juxtaposition of matrices. Okay? That's not how I was taught to think about matrices, but I think it's a very nice way. If you have those three building blocks, one by ones, horizontal juxtaposition of matrices with the same height, vertical juxtaposition of matrices with the same width, okay, then you can build all matrices. Those operations are exactly the scale, fork, and join. Okay, and the types guarantee that when you stack, uh, when you stack, you have uh, you can only stack matrices of the same width, or if you juxtapose them horizontally, they have to be the same height. That's in the types. Okay, where does that come in? Uh, join requires that the, do the co-domains are the same. Fork requires that the domains are the same. Okay. Now, um, so so I'm. So at this point, we're talking about matrices. I'm saying we tried functions. It works out very nicely. But for high dimensional domains, it's too expensive to extract a data representation. So why don't we use matrices in the first place? All right. So we can do that. But now an interesting question arises, which is if uh, a lot of matrix multiplication happens, everywhere we said composition, that gets implemented by matrix multiplication. Okay. Now, matrix multiplication is associative. Why is matrix multiplication associative? It may be a funny question, why is it associative? All right. You might say, well, here's a proof that it's associative. But I want to say, no, that's the hard way. Multiplic matrix multiplication is associative because function composition is associative, and matrix multiplication correctly implements function composition when the functions are linear. I think that's, that's a much more direct way to think about uh, compositionality and about matrix multiplication. Matrix multiplication is a solution of a problem 
which is how do you implement correctly a composition of functions that are represented by matrices. And, and the answer to the algebra problem is matrix multiplication. And the associativity follows from the original motivation for making it in the first place, not after the fact. Okay. So matrix multiplication is associative, but different ways of associating give you different performance, very different performance. Okay. So that means if we're going to use matrices, we want to be clever about how to associate. Okay. The definitions that I showed you um, are not at all biased to how, to how to do the compositions of linear maps. Whatever composition structure you give originally, it's going to maintain that structure. Okay. And some of those compositions will be efficient, and, and other ways that you might have but didn't compose it would be say, more efficient, so more or less efficient. All right. So what we'd like to do, though, is not rely on the programmer to write the compositions in a way that's efficient for automatic differentiation, because the programmer has a different thing he's trying to achieve, which is you know, clarity and modularity. And the compiler should then figure out how to make it efficient, not the programmer, because those two are at odds with each other. Efficiency and modularity are at odds with each other. All right. So fortunately, there's a simple way to, well, I don't mean simple. Fortunately, there's a way to take any uh, composition of matrices and generate the optimal uh, optimal, they'll reassociate it into something that's, that's computationally optimal. Well, it's not simple. There are a couple algorithms. One's an n-cubed algorithm that does uh, dynamic programming, and then there are these much cleverer, subtler algorithms that do n-log n time. Okay. So, all right, well, where is this smarts going to go? Well, here's a cool thing. The cost of matrix multiplication depends only on the dimensions of the matrix. Thing, not the values. Okay, if you want to be really clever and talk about special matrices that you know where you can predict they're going to be zeros, and that's not the case. But let's say you're not talking about special ma special matrices. So the the optimal composition, this multiplication of matrices, depends only on their dimensions. Their dimensions depends only on the types. Okay, in this setting, so the the dimensions is part of the types. So that and that's compile time information because it's a statically typed language. So we can do the optimal reassociation at compile time, not at runtime. That's a huge win. There are two common associations that are made. If you associate all the compositions to the right, you get what's called forward mode AD. If you associate all the left, you get what's called reverse mode AD. <coughs> okay. And for any kind of gradient-based optimization, reverse AD is significantly better. How much better? It depends on the domain uh, dimension. Okay, For machine learning these days, it's huge. It's um, several millions. All right, so how can we do this uh, optimal reassociation? Well, as I said, there are these algorithms, but there's another way, which is if we know, if we just assume that the result, that the final codomain, the final result type is low dimensional, particularly if it's one dimensional, then I think it's the case, and I don't know this for a fact, I think it's the case that, that full left association, in the words reverse mode, is always the best strategy. Okay? I'm not sure that's true. I am sure that it always it corresponds exactly to what's in a machine learning. That's what backpropagation does. Okay, so how can we think about getting this uh, left association automatically? And there's this nice technique, which is uh, called, um, which is related to something that's called continuation passing style. So the idea is the following: If I have a function-like thing from A to B, this could be linear maps or regular functions, and so on. I can represent it by something that says, if I know how to consume B. I can give you a way to consume A. Okay. So these two are equivalent representations. You can transform you know, either one to the other without loss of information. So I, if I have a direct way of going from A to B, there's an indirect representation that says, if I know what I wanted to do with B, then I would know what I wanted to do with A, which is apply this thing and then consume the B. So given an A, we're going to compute the B and then consume it. All right. So that's the meaning. Given a function f, we're going to interpret f, so that's f, and we're going to interpret it by, as something that composes with f on the right and, a, and, a, and some consumer of the resulting b value on the left. Okay, that's the continuation it's called. If you make this transformation, package up as a category, then no matter what composition style you used in the original expression, it's going to turn into fully left, associ uh, fully left associated in the representation. You need a way to kick it off, and that's just by supplying the identity continuation. Okay. And then one point I want to make is, 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 is a, I think, a very, very uh, big performance win here from this perspective, which is, remember, we're going to be computing derivatives of a function at a, at a point in its input. 
And when f is higher dimensional, say in its domain and codomain, or its input and output, then that result is going to be uh, it's going to be something large. Say if we're representing a matrix, it's going to be two dimensional. It's going to be quadratically large. A lot of times, these internal matrices are quite sparse. It could be the zero matrix. That actually happens fairly frequently. It's very sparse. Sparse meaning how, how many uh, elements, uh, well, the density is how many elements are non-zero. Okay, so zero is the sparsest you can get. There's also quite common is the identity matrix. Well, that's also extremely uh, sparse. You think that's like the, the density is the square root of the number of elements. So these matrices can be very sparse. And then that means that you're wasting a lot of computation. Well, if instead of just computing them, we compute them composed with a continuation that, that we're getting in, then we can bypass the construction of the matrices entirely. And we get very small computations. I'm not sure, but I think this is probably a, a very large uh, win performance-wise. Okay, It's also very easy to uh, implement. So oh, there's only 15 minutes left. Okay. Yeah. There's room for questions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. OK. So I think this slide and then a couple more is, is the punchline. All right. So, if we, when, um, so this is a continuation category. As to say, we've got some underlying category, totally arrow, and we've got some ultimate result type R. So this R is going to be the ultimate code domain. And we're just going to package up this notion of continuation. And now we set up another algebra problem, which is how do we, rep, how do we interpret, you know, a, 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 say, a function here, a linear map? Okay, in this category, well, we just did what I said before. It's just we're going to compose on the right with the function. The left is going to be the continuation. And now we say Kant has to preserve structure, meaning those same five equations, always the same five equations. It maps id to id, compositions to compositions, and so on. When we solve this algebra problem, with the help of this little isomorphism, we get this definition. So this definition is reverse mode automatic differentiation. This code is reverse mode. It's much, much simpler than anything I've seen in the literature. The literature talks about graphs and talks about mutations, uh, partial derivatives. Uh, none of that is necessary. Okay, All that's necessary is this little continuation trick. And that trick has nothing to do with automatic differentiation. It's just something that would be in a library. You're programming with this vocabulary. We're going to have a library. It's going to have continuation because it's useful for all kinds of things. Okay, So this is reverse mode AD. Okay, It's general. It's a general AD category parameterized by a continuation transform version of matrices. Triple level subscripts. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. So matrices is, is, so it is indexed by the scalar. Continuation is indexed by, well, in this case, matrices and the final result type. And you plug that into the general AD thing, which is no more complicated than the specialized AD. Okay. So this is reverse mode AD without tiers. Every time I read a paper on Rurismo I want to cry. So I think that's how I came up with this title. Okay. Okay. All right. Now, this is the kind of the final essential trick. This is what gets backprop, okay, which is a even, it's a more specialized version of reverse mode AD that's a little more efficient. Okay. And here's the key idea. If you look at linear transformations from a vector space to its scalar field, Okay. So this u might be uh, r to the million, and s would be r. So it's the underlying scalar field. So in general, you can have linear transformations between any two vector spaces with the same scalar field. But if the result, if the codomain is the scalar field itself, then u, you know, linear maps from u to that scalar field, that's called a, uh, a dual vector. Okay. And there's this lovely duality property in linear algebra. And you see it in terms of matrix transposition. Matrix transposition is all about duality. Okay. And here's the cool thing. If, you, if you're interested in uh, linear maps that result in the scalar field, they're isomorphic to u itself, if u is finite dimensional. Okay. And every one of these linear maps has a particular form, which is the dot product with a, with a matrix, no, sorry, a vector, and then it's waiting for its second argument. Okay. Now, here's the cool thing. If we use the continuation representation, so th this, this is the punchline. We have linear maps from A to B. We use the continuation transformation, and we get a B consumer to an A consumer, linear consumers. But these guys are isomorphic to B and A itself. So we re represent linear maps from A to B by this, in this continuation form with S, the, the, the scalar field. But we can represent that continuation form by just functions from B to A. Okay. And again, there's a very simple specification. 
that relates the continuation to the dual. Again, we set up the five, uh, uh, we set up the algebra problem with uh, five equations and we solve it. And now we get this incredibly lovely form. This relates the dual, uh, th this, this gives you the, the um, uh, implementation of a dual category. Okay? And now we can see, wow, the identity is the identity, composition is the flipped composition. Uh, the left, the extractors are the injectors, the injectors are the extractors, fork is, is join and join is fork, and scale is itself. And if you think of these operations, fork, join, and scale, as being matrix building operations, then what we've done is we've described the transposition of matrices. Okay. So here's backpropagation. Okay. So no mutations, no variables, no graphs, no partial derivatives. It's just the general uh, AD where we use the dual of additive functions. Okay. There are no matrix compositions here. It's extremely efficient. <clears throat> okay. And then I just have a bunch of examples, but I think I'll, I'll pause and take questions. And if there are questions about examples, I'll show them and otherwise not. But why was the dual of scale to scale? Yeah, yeah, that's funny. So the dual is not the inverse, right? So it, if it were the inverse, it would, you'd want to scale right, by the right. inverse, yeah. So it's, it's really, hmm. think of the I can give you a variety of answers, yeah. If, if you want to think about matrices and you take the transpose of one by one, you get itself. I see. Okay. But, I'm not satisfied with that answer because it, it, it leaves the question of, well, why do you use transposition in the first place? What does it mean? What does transposition have to do with linear maps? And the, 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 um, the duality and the continuation structures that I showed you are exactly what motivates um, uh, transposition. So I could say it's because transposition preserves one by one matrices, but that's a backwards answer from my perspective. Uh, transposition is about duality. Not duality is about transposition. So, so I learned about uh, automatic differentiation through the framework of the commutative ring of dual numbers uh, yes. over R. Right. And I was wondering if you could relate some ideas of your work yes. uh, to the language of dual numbers. It seems yeah. to me that your fork idea of take, combining a function with derivative is yeah. exactly appending a dual component yeah. to a yeah, function. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, as I said, they're commonly AD is done in two flavors: <clears throat> uh, forward and reverse mode. Forward mode is, uh, is fairly easy and convenient to express in a lot of programming languages, especially if you have operator overloading. And a way to do that is to, is to everywhere you have numbers, instead use something that's sometimes called dual numbers, which is a pair of a number and a second number. The second number represents the derivative. So it's very much like you see in my original type, like the function that gives you a pair, a number, and, and a linear map. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Um, so yeah, you, you can explain the dual number idea in terms of this uh, categorical form. But of course, if, you have, if, you, if it's a pair of numbers, then you can only talk about differentiation of scalar functions. All right. So it's much, much uh, less general. It's also kind of wrong. The, um, the, the way that forward mode AD done, is done, well, it's correct only because people are careful. If, it, you know, if, if you look at uh, forward mode usually is, uh, is you end up taking functions from dual numbers to dual numbers, a, va a, 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 a value and a derivative to a new value and a derivative. Right. But that, that, that transformation of a number and a derivative to a number and derivative, only some of them are sensible because the derivative out, sorry, the value out cannot depend on the derivative in. And yet the type says it can. Oh, All right. So that, to me, is a fundamental flaw <coughs> in this whole idea of dual numbers in the whole way that uh, forward mode AD, meaning you have to be careful that, that these, these functions from dual numbers to dual numbers, some of them represent diff you know, diff uh, sensible differentiation, some of them don't. If you refactor it and say, no, the value out cannot depend on the, the delta in, you get my representation, which says you take a single number in you get out a single number, that's the value, and another function from a delta to a delta. See, that representation, the, the number out, the value out, cannot depend on the derivative in. Yep. Yeah. Makes sense. So that's something I didn't appreciate until I asked myself exactly the same question, because I did this forward mode as well. And, and I wondered, do these two relate to each other? And that's when I realized, oh, this is really kind of unfortunate aspect of the forward mode. Questions. I have one more. Um, could you go back to your uh, your slide with the uh, see the axioms for a category and a Cartesian category? 
Um, yeah. And immediately yeah. after, you say that your implementation um, of your D hat uh, functor satisfies uh, these two guys. Um, oh, yeah, it does. Maybe. Yeah, okay. And so, so on the next slide, right, you have your implementation of D hat, right? Yes. And I was wondering, um, from what axiom on the previous slide does the Leibniz rule come from? Ah. Oh, it, that's it a different. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's numerical category. Yes, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So the, the, the really, there's an unfortunate thing about the way differentiation is taught in calculus classes and, and the way that symbolic differentiation is done. And the automatic differentiation is done. There's a really unfortunate thing, which is that um, you look at the rules you learn, in, or rules I learned anyway, in differential calculus, and it said things like the derivative of sine is cosine, but it didn't say that. It said the derivative of sine u is cosine u du. All right? The derivative of cosine is, u is minus sine u du. So times the derivative of u. Okay? So every, and then multiplication, the derivative of u times v is the derivative of u. The derivative of the product uv is the derivative of u times v plus the derivative of v times u, right? Every one of those rules has the chain rule embedded in it. Every one of those rules is the chain rule plus another rule. So by using this categorical approach, we say, no, the derivative of, u, of instead of saying the derivative of sine u is cosine u du, the derivative of sine is cosine, plus we have the chain rule. So we don't need to have these kind of complicated rules, every one of which has the chain rule embedded in it. <clears throat> Can you say anything about, uh, did you do exploit these uh, insights, better circuits, or what's the, is that the yes. answer Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, well, I'll tell you what I do, and you can tell me if, if I'm exploiting what you have in mind. <clears throat> so there's this plugin I have. It's, it's a plugin in the, in the Haskell compiler. It's called GHC. Okay. So there's a GHC. Uh, it's a Haskell compiler. I wrote a plugin in it that, that, that transforms uh, the internal representation, which is a type lambda calculus. It's called core. <clears throat> uh, it transforms the regular Haskell code into categorical form and then instantiates it with respect to whatever category you want, for instance, differentiable functions. There are rewrite rules, most of which are just specified in just Haskell code in the rewrite rule sublanguage. Those rewrite rules are true of all, you know, of all categories, if they involve this category language, or Cartesians, if they involve the Cartesian, and so on. So a lot of optimizations in there that work for all interpretations including differentiable functions. So then the idea is that you can plug, take, take your circuits and compile it with a Haskell. Yeah, yeah, so what I actually so do. Right. keep yeah. saying circuit, but. Yeah, well, you know, you know I, I don't mind saying circuits. This whole work was, was motivated by uh, compiling Haskell to hardware. That was my job a few years ago. Yeah. I worked uh, at a hardware company that had this really cool, dynamically reconfigurable uh, um, hardware. So it was like an FPGA, yeah. but it reconfigured it 2 billion times a second instead of like once a year. <clears throat> so it reconfigured it as it ran. So it ran at two, uh, 2 billion times a second, 2 gigahertz, and it reconfigured itself at 2 gigahertz. And there's a huge win from doing this kind of uh, runtime uh, uh, optimization. So my job was, um, you know, originally, uh, originally for things that FPGA is used for, like, uh, uh, you know, running in a router and checking your packets for Russian virus or, you know, whatever. Oh, this would be the reconfiguration? Uh, what would require the re reconfiguration to happen? So ah, reconfiguration is, um, so in this setting, um, three-dimensional circuits are much more efficient than two-dimensional circuits. Mm -hmm. Can be, I mean. Three-dimensional circuit could be much more efficient than two-dimensional circuits. Why? Because most of the power and time taken up during computation is moving electrons. Uh, they have to move from one place to another. Paths in three dimensions are much, much shorter than in two dimensions. So if you can make a three-dimensional FPGA, you can get much better performance. But it's really hard to make a three-dimensional FPGA. So this fellow, Steve Tig had this wonderful idea, this insight, this man was brilliant, and I knew in 30 seconds I wanted to work with this man. And uh, he figured, he, he realized that I can implement a three-dimensional FPGA by implementing one dimension in time instead of space. And that was the, that, that's the point of dynamic reconfigurability. So you get much, much shorter pathways in space-time, and the architecture was called space-time, and it really, honest to God, uh, is based on Minkowski's uh, uh, mathematics of uh, relativity. Hmm. What Minkowski used to so clean up the math that Einstein used. Okay, so my job was, so, so like initially it would be FPGA applications, but, uh, but initially, but eventually it would be all computation. How are we going to program this thing? It's not going to be in any sequential language. Every sequential language is going to be deeply at odds because this is massively parallel. We want to be doing millions of operations simultaneously. Okay? 
meaning 2 billion million operations per second. Um, so it's not going to be any sequential language, but a purely functional language doesn't have the sequential bias. So how do we compile the purely functional language into a three-dimensional FPGA? That was my job. And, and I hit on this solution, which is I realized one day that you could, you could describe circuits using this language that I've shown you. This language is a, it's a language that can be used to describe circuits. Sure. Hardware engineers don't do that, but you could. It's also, and then I remembered, whoa, there's a 1980 result that says the type lambda calculus is equivalent to this vocabulary, and Haskell is equivalent to the type lambda calculus. So if I go from Haskell, put it through GHC, go to its internal language, which is a very small lambda calculus, I take that internal language and transform it into the language of categories, and then instead of instantiating it with the usual one, plain old computable functions, I do the category of circuits, of massively parallel circuits. And then, I, and then I represent that in terms of the, the graphs as a rendering of that representation. And then I generate Verilog code. Eventually, we were going to do things that are you know, better than Verilog, but that's where we started. That really was my original motivation. But then one day I realized, because I had worked on uh, AD a while ago, I realized that, um, that the, uh, the categorical approach is a much, much better way to think about automatic differentiation. So, All right. I think that's a good yeah. stopping place. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, I'll be, you know, I'll be around.